6 minutes and 51 seconds. That's how long it took a gas car with over 1,000 horsepower to go around the Nürburgring. But what if it had nearly 3,000 horsepower? Well, an electric car has done exactly that, but it took nearly 7 minutes. Now immediately, this made me curious. Why would a car with nearly 3 times the power have a slower lap time? And there's no shade either. Anything under 7 minutes is incredibly respectable. But I'm still curious as to the why behind all of this. To figure it out, we're going to focus on two main questions. First, can both cars run an entire lap at full power? In other words, do they have enough energy stored on board? And second, can you actually use 3000 horsepower? Can any tires out there actually put down this much power? And if so, what speed is required to do so? So our first question, do we have enough energy stored on board for a full lap at full power? So let's first compare our powertrains. Of course, with the ZR1, we've got our V8 engine producing 1,064 horsepower or about 873 kilowatts. With the U9X, we have four electric motors for a combined 2,220 kilowatts or about 2,977 horsepower. Power. Now, the Corvette has an 18.5 gallon fuel tank, and our U9X has an 80 kilowatt hour battery pack. So, we need to be able to compare these directly so we can convert gallons of gasoline into kilowatt hours. One gallon of gasoline is roughly equivalent to 33.7 kilowatt hours. So, 18.5 times 33.7, that gives us total energy stored on board of 623 kilowatt hours. Now, that sounds amazing, but of course, combustion engines are not very efficient. So let's assume our combustion engine has a 25% efficiency. Of course, we're talking about operating at wide open throttle. And even if this number is a little high or a little low, it won't change our conclusion. So don't worry too much about the efficiency number. But multiplying those together, we get a useful energy on the Corvette of about 155 kilowatt hours. Versus, of course, electric motors are far more efficient. So we're going to assume an efficiency of 92.5% here going from the battery getting to the wheels and so we are going to have a useful energy of about 74 kilowatt hours. Now you can already see the Corvette does have more energy but does it actually matter? So now that we know how much useful energy each car has with that amount of energy, how long could the car deliver full power? Now this is a very simple thing to calculate. We're simply going to take energy and divide it by power, and so that will give us time. So 155 kilowatt hours divided by 873 kilowatts. We'll multiply that by 60 minutes in an hour to convert it to minutes, and that gives us a time of 10.7 minutes. So the Corvette, with this efficiency, could run flat out for 10.7 minutes. Now of course it did the lap in less than 7 minutes which means it is never power limited for the entirety of that lap. Now, you might be thinking, well, of course, it's not going to be flat out for the entire lap, and you're absolutely right. So I actually spoke with the Corvette team and asked them about how much time do these vehicles actually spend at wide open throttle, and they said for the Z06, it was 57% of the entire lap time going around the Nürburgring. For the ZR1, it was 40%, and for the ZR1X, it was 44%. So what about the U9X? So for the U9X, 74 kilowatt hours divided by 2,220 multiplied by 60, and that gives us a total time of just two minutes. Two minutes that it can supply full power. Now, this may or may not be a problem. Two minutes divided by seven, well, that gives us 28.6% of the lap that it could actually deliver that much power, but that means zero power for the rest of the lap. And considering the percentage which the ZR1 is spending at wide open throttle, I think this may May actually be a concern. Another way of thinking about this is take that 2 over 7 and multiply it by our power. That gives us 634 kilowatts. That's the average power that this vehicle can deliver throughout that entire lap. So at points it could be higher, at points it could be lower. But note that this average power is actually less than the average power that the Corvette could deliver because of course it is not energy limited. And actually when you look at the U9X going down the main straight, they lift once they hit 350 kilometers per hour. So they may be doing a little bit of energy saving there and they may perhaps be doing a little bit of energy saving elsewhere on the track. A little bit of lift and coast. Alright, so we've learned so far that it probably doesn't have enough energy to go all out on a full lap. But there's another big question which is can the tires even put down that much power? Did someone what? say tires? Who's that? Oh. 
Hey there, this portion of the video is sponsored by Continental, who, by the way, never tells me I have a problem, but instead happily feeds my addiction. Today, we're talking about the True Contact Tour 54, a long-lasting all-season touring tire for passenger cars and crossovers. Because the reality is, despite my personal preference for performance tires, most people want a tire that's comfortable and really really long lasting. And that's exactly where this sits, as it is Continental's longest lasting tire they sell today, with up to an 80,000 mile warranty. It's got plenty of tread depth, a compound that helps reduce wear, and also focuses on excellent wet grip, with deep main grooves to handle the rain, and sipes to help handle the snow. And there are helpful indicators that wear away, letting you know when your tire is no longer optimal for wet or snow. And if the D for dry disappears, it's time to replace the tire. And whether your car is gas or electric, it's built to handle the loads, while the compound optimizes both range and longevity. So thanks, Continental. All right, back to the whiteboard. Sorry, I um, just blacked out for a moment. Um, where, where were we? Oh, right, tires. So the real question is, at what speed can you put down all of the car's power? Right, because obviously, with nearly 3,000 horsepower, if you put it down immediately, you're just gonna do a giant burnout. But eventually, you will reach a speed where you are no longer traction limited. So what speed is that? Now this is actually very easy to calculate with one simple equation. Power equals force times velocity. Velocity, that's what we're trying to figure out. At what speed can we apply that full power? So because we're going with maximum power, we can set that equal to 2,220, and we now need to know what is the maximum force these tires can apply, where are they at the limit of friction? And so that is of course equal to the frictional coefficient, 1.2, multiplied by the normal force, so the mass of the vehicle, 2,480 kilograms multiplied by gravity. So we plug in all these numbers, all we're left with is velocity, and that tells us a speed of 76 meters per second, or about 274 kilometers per hour, or about 170 miles per hour. So anything below that, anything below 170 miles per hour, it won't be able to put the full power down, and then above that, it will be able to. All right, but 170 miles per hour, what does that even mean? We need some context, right? Well, the fastest car to ever go around the ring, a race car, by the way, was the Porsche 919 Hybrid Evo, which did it in a blistering 5 minutes 19.55 seconds. This was at an average speed of 234 kilometers per hour or about 145 miles per hour. So the fastest car to ever do it was on average well under the speed at which the U9X can put down full power. What does that mean? Well, the U9X will rarely be putting down full power. Okay, but I have a confession. This is all completely wrong. Nonsense. Do you know why? Well, because we're assuming all of the power goes wherever it's needed. So in reality, we need to take into consideration that each wheel has one motor. So for the front axle, you have 1100 kilowatts, and for the rear axle, you have 1100 kilowatts, and you can't send more than that to either axle. So why is this a problem? Well, once you start accelerating, that weight, that load transfer is gonna go to that rear tire. Now, if you have more weight on that rear axle, it means it has more available grip and so it can put down more power. On the flip side, if you have less weight on that front axle, it means it has less grip and it can put down less power. So the speed at which the rear tire can finally put down the full amount of power it has, 1110 kilowatts, is going to be less than this number we calculated earlier. And because the load is being taken away from the front and transferred to that rear axle, the front is going to have a much higher speed that it can put down that full 1110 kilowatts than we calculated previously. So really, we need to calculate the speed at which each axle can finally put down full power. And when both axles can finally put down full power, we know the point at which we're no longer traction limited. All right, well, we're gonna need a few more variables to figure this out. All right, deep breaths, everyone. It's about to get a little bit gnarly. You're gonna have to turn off TikTok brain. You're actually gonna have to focus. But I believe in you, all right? Even if your parents never told you they did, I'm telling you right now, I believe in you. You can focus, you got this. The conclusion is really cool, so here we go. What are we trying to figure out? We're trying to figure out the... 
I don't know. We're trying to figure out the speed where we can apply full power on the rear axle. So we've already learned this equation, right? Power equals force times velocity. We've already learned that force is equal to our frictional coefficient multiplied by our normal force. What's changed is now we have to take into consideration load transfer. So the normal force, assuming this vehicle has a 50-50 weight distribution, is going to be half the load of the vehicle, of course, plus whatever additional load we get to that axle from the acceleration. So mass times acceleration times the height of our center of gravity divided by our wheelbase. So as you can see this equation here, as acceleration goes up, the amount of normal force that you have on your rear axle also goes up, which means the speed at which you can apply full power goes down. So the question then becomes, how much are we accelerating? Now we can figure out acceleration by looking at all of the forces acting on our car. So of course we have the force of traction, these tires are trying to accelerate the vehicle. But some of that force has to go into aerodynamic losses. Some of that force has to go into rolling resistance losses. But where do we want it to go? We want it to go into linear acceleration, so this thing accelerates as quickly as possible. So we can say FT equals FLA plus F arrow plus FRR. All right, well, we can rearrange that and say the force of linear acceleration is equal to the traction force minus aerodynamic drag minus rolling resistance. Of course, we can fill in what these equations are, no problem, and then we can solve these equations for acceleration. So mass times acceleration, that's the acceleration we're solving for, and that gives us this long, gnarly equation here. So we take this equation for acceleration, we plug it into our normal force equation right there, we plug that normal force equation into our our tire force on the rear right here, we plug in that force at the rear into our power equation and suddenly the only variable we're left with is velocity. So we simply solve for velocity. Wow, just like that, so easy, cool. And what do we get? 56 meters per second or about 202 kilometers per hour or about 126 miles per hour. That is the speed at which the rear axle can apply full power. And look, just like I told you and predicted, it is less than the number we calculated earlier because you have more load on that rear axle. So you can apply the full power sooner. Okay, so now we know the speed at which the rear tops out and now becomes power limited instead of traction limited. And while it is actually high, there are a good number of times that the car is driving over 200 kilometers per hour, so it is in fact getting a decent bit of use on the lap. But what about the front axle? All right, so for the front axle, a little bit trickier, but we got this. There's only two changes we need to make versus our previous math in order to figure this out. The first one being our normal force, right? So previously, the normal force on the rear tire was half the weight of the vehicle plus some amount from acceleration. Now it's gonna be half the weight of the vehicle minus that same amount from acceleration, right? So we're just putting a minus there instead of a plus there, which means as our acceleration goes up, the normal force on that front tire goes down, so the speed at which you can apply full power goes up. All right, the second thing we need to figure out is this force of traction. So previously, we were traction limited, but now now we're gonna be at a speed where the rear is power limited. So we're no longer traction limited. So this FT is no longer gonna be equal to mu mg, our traction limit. Instead, it's going to be reliant on our total power. So we're gonna be at the point where we can finally put down full power. So this FT is going to be our total amount of power divided by our velocity. So in our acceleration equation, instead of mu mg, we're putting in our total power divided by a velocity. Now, of course, that means we're adding in another V which makes solving for V more complicated, but that's what calculators are for. So you put A into N, you put N into F, you put F into P, you solve for B, boom, just like that, easy peasy, what do you get? The front velocity, at which you can finally put down full power, 99 meters per second, or about 357 kilometers per hour, or about 222 miles per hour, so below that speed, this car cannot put down its full power. Now, as we already mentioned, the driver was lifting at 350 kilometers per hour. So it is possible that they never, during the entirety of the lap, had the ability to put down the full 3,000 horsepower. Now that said, if you take into consideration other variables like adding in the weight of the driver and then having some efficiency loss from your gears, that could bring this number down to about 330 kilometers per hour where you start to be able to use that full power. And 
And if you had meaningful downforce, that number would drop even further. So it may be using its full power very briefly on the main straight, but that's about it. So what have we learned? Well, there comes a point where power becomes meaningless. And for many scenarios, this car reaches that point. It's still difficult to get a sub seven minute lap time. But the reason why a 3000 horsepower vehicle is slower than a 1000 horsepower vehicle is because there's never really a time that it can actually use that 3000 horsepower. It's really all about grip, which is a mixture of aerodynamics and tires. And so what a delightful piece of information to close out on as the Porsche 911 GT3 RS with only 386 kilowatts or about 520 horsepower, less than half that of the Corvette ZR1 is actually quicker than the ZR1 with a 649.3 lap time. Why? Well, it has more downforce and it weighs less, which means it has more grip, which means it can go around corners faster. And that's what's important on the Nurburgring. And that's not throwing shade at the ZR1, especially when you consider that it's a lower cost vehicle and it's more obtainable than a GT3 RS. But the lesson here remains, for the ring, grip is king. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.